How's it going, everyone? Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Matt, the worship director here at Grace and Peace Church. We're going to jump in right now, starting with a short scripture reading, followed by a time of singing as a way to sort of just prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits for the message and just to fix our uh, lives, or orient our lives around the reality of the presence of God, um, the love he has for us, and the way he wants to shape and use our lives uh, for his kingdom. This is all about acknowledging, recognizing, and honoring God through our focus, through reading his word, and through expressing our, our hearts and our lives through singing. As always, we're super grateful you're here joining us, and we're going to get started right now with our scripture reading. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. So
Thanks for checking out Grace and Peace Online. Glad to have you here worshiping with our community. Uh, if you want to get connected, get involved, just check out our website, reach back to Nate or me. I'm Carissa May, the associate pastor, and I'm here kicking off our new series this week. So let's get started. Seven years ago, when my daughter Bonnie started playing roller derby, I was at a parent meeting and just listening to information about the up upcoming travel tournament. So the skaters were flying to Washington and then there was talk about hotels and carpools, you know, just that normal travel stuff. No big deal. I got that. But in another corner of the rink, there was a group of parents who were themselves players in an adult league. They were having a different discussion. Their conversation was all about what wheels to bring, like specifically how many different sets of eight wheels. That I did not understand. We were new to the sport. Bonnie's skates had wheels, so whatever were on her skates, that's what was going in the bag. And I remember saying to another newbie parent, we are never going to get so into the sport that we are going to have special wheels for every occasion. Total rookie mistake. I was wrong. The players who were discussing wheels knew from experience that the surface on the place that we were flying to would determine the optimal hardness of the wheels. And the action of the wheels could not only affect the outcome of the game, but they could pose or eliminate a hazard to the player. Well, like I said, I was new. I didn't know any better. In fact, I was so ignorant that rather than hearing those players' conversations as experiential and informed, I just sort of judged them for what I thought was picking up travel outfits. Theirs was this important collective voice, and they were sharing valuable insight, and it would have served me well to pay attention to them. Now, I know better. Over time, that conversation that I had ignored at first took hold. Now I got tons of wheels, but more importantly, now I make it a point to listen and to continue to learn from people with critical insight. I've learned to ask questions and to be prepared and to make necessary adjustments according to input. And it's always a veteran skater with knowledge of the local context who brings the wisdom who's speaking from experience. And that brings me to our new series and to Peter and what he has to say in his first letter. But let me have Peter introduce himself. These are his words stating who the letter is from. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now Peter, you may know, was a fisherman. Together with his brother Andrew, he was the first to follow Jesus. Peter was with Christ from the beginning of his public ministry, and he was with Christ as the Lord ascended and declared his imminent return. After that, Peter carried on the mission of Christ. He preached the first post-resurrection sermon, and then he went on to minister especially to the Jewish converts. Peter was in Christ's inner circle. The 12 apostles who walked with Jesus and learned his ways alongside him. He had access to the most intimate instruction. Even beyond that, Peter was one of three of the 12 who enjoyed an even deeper connection. Peter was at the very core of Christ's companions. And it was from that vantage point that Peter was the first to declare this about Jesus. You are the Messiah the son of the living God. But before that enlightened moment, when Peter was a newbie, he was ignorant and made rookie mistakes. I appreciate that about him. Peter lived and learned. He got it right, then wrong, then right, more often than wrong. And by the time he authorized his letter, some 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter was speaking from experience and with great authority. His practical experience and field work are really unparalleled. Peter carried out a part of Christ's mission that was uniquely fitted to him and he lived purposefully for Christ toward that end. So his letters are a valid testimony of what 
actual Christ following really means and what the kingdom of God on earth is supposed to look like. Peter speaks from experience and it would serve us well to learn from him. Now I said we're in 1 Peter today, but Peter sent two letters called general epistles. Now just for information, the letters are considered general in the sense that they were meant to be circulated among multiple churches and they were spread across many regions. So the subject matter is not particular, it's generalized. And in this case, the primary subject was this, how to live faithfully toward Christ in a hostile environment. In other words, how to be Christian in Rome and its regions with the tension and oppression and with the competing demands and allegiances. Now we're going to discuss all those subjects over the next few weeks, but today I just want to look at one thing. Peter's audience. The people who were meant to hear the letter. Because that tells us something really important about who Peter became in his years following Christ. Now we already read the first line of the letter, the from line. The rest of the introduction says this. To God's elect. Exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with His blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. To God's elect, exiles scattered. The day Peter met Jesus on the shore of Galilee, Peter probably knew who the elect were. The elect were the nation of Israel, exclusively Israel. Peter was Jewish, so he was elect. He was a member of the people group chosen by God to be light to the world, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Israel was chosen and a covenant, a promise made between God and Abraham sealed that special relationship. And when the covenant was made, the promise to Abraham included this. You, Abraham, shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And also this, I, God, will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven as, as, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. God chose Abraham, and God would continue to increase the nations after him, and the Lord would bless them and count all the nations on earth among those blessed. So on his first day hanging out with Jesus, Peter would have gotten the concept of election right in that traditional Israel-only sense. But he was going to learn that his thinking was limited, even profoundly wrong, in light of Christ. Let me tell you how that happened. This is from Acts chapter 10. In the days of the early church after Christ, Peter's praying on the roof of the house, and then this. He fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, hearing that, Peter was probably appalled. He was Jewish. Yes, he was a Christ follower, but that's a way of life. Peter's faith was centered on the reality of the Messiah and of his way of being, but he was still Jewish. So the mixed meal that the vision suggested was a huge rule breaker for him. But three times Peter fell asleep, three times he dreamed, mix the food, kill and eat. Well, a day earlier across town, the Spirit of God was speaking to a Gentile soldier called Cornelius. And to Cornelius, the angel basically said, you have got to meet Peter. So Cornelius sent some men to fetch him. Next day, Peter's on the roof, bang, bang, there's Cornelius' men at the door. Excuse me, is Peter here? Peter, you have got to go to Joppa to meet Cornelius 
Let's go. So, not kidding. An hour earlier, Peter probably would have said, no, gross, it is unlawful for a Jewish man to hang out with and eat with a non-Jew. But hang on, because at the end of his vision, Peter also heard this. Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I, the Lord, have sent them. Now, I think it's fair to say that Peter was culturally prejudiced, but that impulse was countered before it could be engaged. The Spirit of God preempted Peter. So, knock, knock, and off they all went to meet Cornelius and his household, who had gathered and were waiting to hear the word of the Lord through Peter. Then Peter began to teach them this way. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And Peter went on to share with them all of the news of Christ's life and death and resurrection and forgiveness and the Holy Spirit rested on the household and they were all filled just as the Jewish disciples had been with the same sanctifying grace and the power to abide in Jesus. That day, Peter was eyewitness to the adoption of Cornelius and his family into God's promise to Israel through Abraham. Peter saw the birth of stars, so to speak, the addition of Gentiles to the multitudes counted by God for purpose and for blessing. And Peter was a part of all of that because a lesson that he learned in a moment spent with God, and he let a core belief be transformed in light of the equity that all people are meant to enjoy in Jesus. So that's some of Peter's backstory. And that's why 30 years later, when Peter is writing to the elect in all the provinces, we can hear it as this broad, inviting term. This general letter with its empathy and instruction and hopefulness was for all who suffered for the faith, Jewish and non-Jewish converts alike, as one, all God's children with the adopted people sharing the same status and inheritance and likeness of one father, no favorites, just family in the very best sense. Now earlier week, earlier this week, I read an article titled, What's Wrong with Thinking of Church as Family? Like maybe you've heard of people refer to their church family. I say my church family. So I want to look at that objection for a minute. According to the author, the family metaphor can stand in the way of a congregation being truly open and inclusive. Better, she says, to consider that the church is a movement defined by shared values, commitments, and actions, not heritage or appearance. Absolutely, yes. If it is the impulse of any local congregation to focus inward, to foster homogeneity or create barriers to access, no matter how subtle or unintentional, then family in that nuclear, insular sense is damaging and totally unlike the ethos of Christ. But I'd still rather retain what Christ was making and naming. One unified people, all related to Him. One church where there is one Father through whose Son, everyone who worships and follows Him, is made brothers and sisters with shared values, commitments, and actions. So for me, I guess it's an and both. Family as a descriptor or state of being matters. A distant relative is a relative, right? Somehow there's a connection and it's unique and it just doesn't immediately exist among strangers. Relatives belong to one another without any other qualification and very often that thread, as thin as it is, is enough for our, our, us to concern ourselves with them. Like, think about it. If Facebook has done nothing else, it's let us know when our third cousin had a baby that we will never meet in person. But because that baby popped up as in our newsfeed as a member of our family, we care somehow. At least we understand that somewhere our family is experiencing joy and we can share in that sweet news. But I think the family metaphor, metaphor especially matters in the church right now because of bitter news that we're hearing. 
I believe that we need to hold on to the broad sense of family because we need to see and hear that our seemingly distant relatives, brothers and sisters in Christ, in communities across the world, are suffering. And when that news pops up, we should be prompted by our bond in Christ to care to the point of action. We belong to each other. And that means sharing joy and sorrow. And it means standing in the gap when some are hurting. Peter learned a lesson about racial prejudice that changed his ministry, and necessarily so. And it was such an important change of heart that God himself taught Peter that lesson and brought about the transformation in him. Then Peter saw what Christ's family, the kingdom of God, would ultimately look like. And his letters show that inclusion continued to matter. It still matters. And yet racism persists. It exists in systems and cultures and between people groups. We have family members crying out against it. Oppressed and marginalized people are crying out against the brutality of it. In their suffering, our relatives, distant or near, are raising their voices. Our family is injured and we must not be idle in response. God's promise of blessing to his people is not some distant notion of a far off heaven, but a promise of abundant life now, where justice and mercy and love are central to daily life and afforded to all humans equally. But prejudice and apathy thwart God's goodness. And proof of that is persistent inequity and division and injustice in the world. I think that when we're not personally affected, we can be complacent, inactive, silent. And to that I want to say, then let's make all injustice personal. Let's see oppressed people for who they are. Family, your family, our family. And for that reason, I also want to say, don't just respond to your family's plight with social media or symbols while keeping a comfortable distance, but be united together in action and compassion. Every incident of violence or discrimination committed against a family member should be felt. Each one deserves a response. Every person deserves our care and concern. And yes, that might get overwhelming, but I think it's time to be overwhelmed if that moves us to speak and defend and affect change everywhere that we can. God started the policy of non-discrimination in the person of Jesus who lived it out for the sake of the whole world. Peter got a refresher course to bring that home. So when Peter writes to the elect here, I think a fair read is this. Dear family with whom we are not personally acquainted, your suffering has reached our ears and we are responding now. People have engaged in this battle for thousands of years. And I'm just saying, we have to take up our part on the right side of the battle, which is to absolutely oppose injustice, prejudice, and oppression in our lifetimes and in our communities and throughout distant provinces for the sake of our collective family and in the name of God. I can't say what that will mean for you specifically in your distinct context as an individual, but I'll bet you know so I'm just asking that we make all of this a very personal problem, that we hear suffering and respond, that we listen to voices of those experiences and then act better because of it, that we identify justice and injustice and confront the sources and mitigate circumstances. Mitigate circumstances. We have to make this personal. Speak up somehow act out somehow. For Pete's sake, go to Cornelius' house, whatever that means for you, and see that his family is yours, and that God deemed every one of them worthy of the peace and hope that you enjoy 
and that was always meant to be shared equally. And as you go, as you meet your Cornelius, as you encounter those once distant elect in the far provinces of Atlanta and Indianapolis and Chicago and Libby Lake and Crown Heights, please bear this in mind and let it guide you. By this we know, by this we know love, that Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Grace and peace. Rejoice in knowing that we never walk alone. Know the grace and peace of Christ walking beside us, guiding and protecting us. Share this comfort with one another and feel his presence each moment of each day. Amen.